Dave, I'm not hearing you. Are you going to share? Okay. Yep. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, our Friday night get together. We hold every two weeks for the next few months. Um, so I'm Dave Raleigh. I'm your host for the evening. Uh, we're going to be talking about air data systems. It looks like from the uh, uh, participants list that we've slowed down some. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So we are in the second of nine uh, seminars or webinars for this year. Uh, tonight's topic is air data systems. So we're going to be talking about uh, airspeed, altimeter, and variometer instruments, what's being measured, and how we can use it. The presentation download uh, will be put out on the SSA website. So the slide deck will be put out on the SSA website. You need to go to the members login. And on your My Home page to News and Resources and go to Webinars. Uh, the other one is the webinar should also be posted there uh, sometime after the uh, webinar is completed. We're recording this so that we have these available. We want to be sure uh, the SSA, thank the SSA. They're providing the uh, webinar software we're using, and Frank Whiteley is acting as our uh, webinar manager this evening. And so we also are making these webinars uh, eligible, the participation in them eligible for WINGS credit. We have uh, three of the FAST team members in our club for uh, our region. So Quay Snyder, Alice Palmer, and Mark Palmer. So these folks work to make sure that uh, you get credit. If you've registered for the wing for this seminar with your WINGS user ID, then the credit will be applied over the next few days. Uh, if you used a different user ID, uh, you'll need to send me both the uh, uh, email, both emails so that we can get that sorted out. So now one of the things, only the live webinar is uh, eligible for credit. So if somebody watches this and uh, you know, on a video later, they don't get credit for it. You're getting credit for it. So uh, stay the course. We have some of our club instructors. Uh, these folks, one or more of these folks are working in the background to collect and answer your questions. We will have a question and answer se uh, section, section at the end of the overall webinar. So we'll try to work through questions at that point. Some of the acknowledgments. Uh, some of the slides in here were uh, originally developed by Richard Lancaster. They turned up in the uh, soaring, the FAA soaring handbook. And so the K-21 uh, outlines that you'll find, those are Alexander Schleicher. And the other content on the slides with the light blue header uh, came from Richard and were included in the uh, uh, soaring handbook. So our purpose is for folks to gain an understanding of the air data systems in their gliders, to get a greater insight into variometers, and to develop some tools that you can use in flight. Our uh, session this evening will run roughly two hours. So uh, that gives you an idea of uh, how long you're going to be on here. So basically what we're looking at with these, with the air data systems in our gliders is we have data that is collected. Uh, it's transformed into information that is presented to us and we can use that inf information to make decisions. Uh, what you have to remember is that in a lot of this, it doesn't have to be absolutely accurate. Close is usually good enough for most of the stuff that you're going to have displayed to you in the cockpit, anything to the right of the decimal point doesn't have a safety implication. Your real, the real question that you have to answer is, is the information that you're using for your decision making good enough to help you make decisions? So a little background for the atmosphere. We're, uh, uh, what we've got is uh, sea level pressure. 
And you'll notice that we go from roughly uh, 1013 millibars to uh, 505 millibars at 18,000 feet. Interestingly enough, uh, notice that this is a curve. That drop off is not linear. Uh, if you were to do the calculations uh, as if it were linear, it would give you a uh, value that would show uh, that you were at 7,700 feet. If you take the actual measurement uh, for a 7,000 foot airport, uh, the value would be, uh, uh, the pressure number would be like 780 millibars, where if you did it from a linear, you'd say it was 760 millibars. So while it does, it does have from sea level to 18,000, this portion of the curve is not linear right in here. When we're uh, working with uh, the various pressures, numbers that we have, the red numbers on this chart are the numbering systems that we use in the US. The blue numbers are the, SA, uh, the uh, SI numbers, the, uh, the standard uh, numbers. Interestingly enough, millibars, which is used is, uh, you know, it's it's not an SI unit, but it is used commonly uh, in aviation. Basically, the sea level numbers match right here. So a one millibar, you can see it's a very small number from a PSI perspective. Uh, one of the things when you're around an aircraft that you need to be aware of. If you blow hard and not as hard as, you, or if you blew harder than you'd take to inflate a balloon that you were blowing up for your kid's party or to play, you know, make funny noises with it. Most of us can generate five PSI when we seal our lips around a tube and blow hard. Okay, you're gonna see later, we're gonna take a look at how many millibars it takes to have uh, 30 knots show on an airspeed indicator and how many millibars it takes to show 60 knots on an airspeed indicator. Um, and it's still single digit millibar numbers. So when you see how small the PSI is, never, never blow into it, you know, seal your mouth around and blow into a tube connected to an instrument on a glider. Okay, one of the numbers that you'll see for air density, you'll see it expressed as uh, uh, kilopascals. Uh, you can also see it over here as kilograms per meter cubed or grams per centimeter, cubic centimeter, slugs, and cubic feet, okay. Basically, pressure decreases, the density decreases. Temperature increases, the density decreases. Air density determines the performance and some of our safety limits. The density altitude is equivalent to standard altitude for a measured density. So when we say 10,000 feet density altitude, then that's the uh, air density equivalent to that altitude. Sea level adjusted barometric pressure generally does not swing more than about an inch and a half in mercury or about 51 millibars, plus or minus 51 millibars. So what it boils down to is when it comes to it, temperature is gonna be the big driver for air density. The uh, basic system, the airspeed indicator and the altimeter our safety of flight instruments, the variometer, is performance. Now, all three of these are precision instruments. The altimeter is probably the simplest from a mechanical viewpoint. I'm sorry, the altimeter is the simplest from a mechanical viewpoint. The airspeed indicator is the next simplest. It's kind of funny, the variometer is simple but it turns out, especially for how we use it, it's probably the most complex instrument to understand. One of the things that you do have to keep in mind with this 
is all of these instruments are measuring pressure. So the altimeter measures pressure against a standard pressure. It has a capsule in there at a standard pressure. Airspeed re uh, measures relative pressure between two pressure sources. And the variometer is measuring pressure, but what it's displaying is the rate of change of pressure. So these instruments are not airflow instruments. These instruments are all pressure instruments. So the first one we're going to talk about is the altimeter because it's the simplest. With the altimeter, it has a capsule. The term for it is aneroid. It is a little metal capsule, copper, beryllium alloy, copper and beryllium alloy. And it is flexible. And so when we're connected to the static port, this capsule is in here. It is connected to a gear train. This is just a simple a simplification of it. And so when the static pressure changes, this capsule expands and contracts. This rack moves back and forth and the pinion turns. Okay. With altimeters, they're calibrated at sea level under standard atmospheric conditions. They have errors under all other conditions. The sensing mechanism in this case is basically the uh, analog approach. Okay. We'll talk about digital towards the end. So, but we're going to be talking for most of these instruments because a large number of us still have aircraft with steam gauges in them. So this is how they work. So with the uh, altimeters operation, if we, the static pressure is exposed to the local air, the pressure inside the casing will equalize with the pressure from outside. And so that will change the uh, size, the volume of the capsule. Notice that we sea level, the capsule is rather small. We're pointing at zero. We're assuming a standard pressure. If we take it up to 3,500 feet, we've dropped to 890 millibars at the static port. When it equalized the pressure, this vessel expanded and that moved through the gear train, it moved the pointer. So the decrease in pressure caused the capsule to expand and the gear train caused the needle to rotate, okay? The um, pressure, the aircraft moving through the air changes the air pressure surrounding it. And, you know, so one of the things is you have to choose the correct location for the aircraft's uh, static port so that you're picking up the static that is closest or you're picking up the pressure that is closest to the uh, uh, atmosphere around the aircraft to use for the static pressure. So we want, if possible, we want it in undisturbed flow deep in the boundary layer and clear of most of the aircraft's flow field. Common locations for static ports. Uh, Shimp Hearth likes to put static ports at the front edge of the canopy. Uh, they also have been known to put static ports underneath their wings. Schleicher likes to put static ports back on the aft fuselage. And I don't, uh, there is an alternative location, and that is you can pick up static ports on a probe mounted to the front of the fin. And those static ports on the front of the fin can be used either for instruments, or in some cases it can be used, if the aircraft certified with it, can be used as your primary static port for your uh, flight instruments. So, Basically, like on the K-21, the, fus uh, the static ports that are on the aft fuselage are the static ports that are used for the aircraft certification. And so then you are plumbed with a line all the way up to the altimeter. Usually what will happen is you will have symmetric static points, symmetric static ports. Uh, so one or two static ports on each side of the fuselage located in a mirror location. 
And that way, basically, those ports will be connected together and one tube runs forward to the altimeter. And so hope, you know, the, the goal there is, is that even if the aircraft is uh, slipping or uh, skidding, that the pressure for the atmosphere around the aircraft will average out. So <clears throat> basically we were looking at just an altimeter uh, early aviation did not use an adjustable altimeter or what they call a sensitive altimeter. Uh, sometime around 1929, uh, in that time frame, uh, Paul Kohlsman, the German immigrant, invented the adjustable barometric adjustment for an altimeter. And what he did is he uh, set the scale you can see the scale over here on the side. He's got it set so that you're uh, setting the adjustment to a sea level adjusted barometric pressure. This way, uh, if it's reported to you as a sea level adjusted barometric pressure, everybody dials the same number and they don't have to do any arithmetic in the cockpit. Barometric pressure drops drops roughly one inch per thousand feet above sea level. And of course, remember that's not a linear relationship, but it's just a rough one. So if we're in Denver with a 29.92 inches of mercury sea level adjusted barometric pressure, that's based on a local reading that's gonna be approximately 25 or 24.92 inches of mercury. With the three-pointer uh, altimeter, we have a long, thin pointer, and this one reads tens of thousands of feet. The short pointer right here reads in thousands of feet, and then the medium-length pointer reads in hundreds of feet. The window on the right side in this particular uh, illustration is the uh, atmospheric pressure, which is adjusted by, that's the calls, we call it the Kohlsman window, and that's adjusted by the knob that's illustrated over here on the bottom left. So this particular altimeter is reading 10,180 feet MSL with a barometric pressure setting of 2992. The stripes at the bottom, right here. Okay, these get included. What happens is they will be fully concealed. There's a, another piece that's rotating with this when it's rotating. These will be fully concealed above 15,000 feet and fully visible below 10,000 feet. So right now with the 10,180, it is partially hidden. Now, one of the things that you've got to do with your pedostatic system is you need some checks. The advisory circular 4313-1B change one. It's got to be change one. Uh, the 4313-1B does not have the procedures that we're going to talk about here. But in 4313-1B, change one, in chapter 12, in section four, there are standard procedures to be used for system leak tests, for static systems, the pedo system, maintenance precautions, and issues that you need to take care of when you're replacing lines, like if you have to replace, you know, for instance, we use, uh, very often we're using a vinyl plastic line that gets hard with age. Um, Blanick interestingly uses a uh, black rubber fiber coated, uh, cloth coated that dries out and cracks with age. So, uh, you know, having to replace the flexible lines in an aircraft is something that you should expect to have to happen you know, have to have done over a period of time as you're working with your, as your aid, aircraft ages. One of the things that you want to do is for 
the uh, instruments in your aircraft. Uh, you need to check and see if in the documentation for the instrument they have some kind of change. You look at the standard procedures, check the instrument in your aircraft if you can get the manufacturer's documentation to be sure that their recommended methods of testing the instrument because testing the aircraft or testing the instrument. Make sure that these procedures that are shown in the advisory circular uh, match what the manufacturer says can be done with their instrument. So I've got an altimeter dis demonstration. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a mon water manometer. Uh, in general, instrument shops use things that are calibrated. They may even be using a mercury manometer, although I haven't seen one of those in probably 20 years. Uh, but we're going to use a uh, water manometer water manometers are more sensitive and uh as uh dick johnson made a remark in the article he had in soaring magazine in about 1989 the water manometer is more sensitive and allows us to, to see the phenomenon easier at the airspeeds that we use because we don't fly 500 knots you know we're flying what 100 knots max for most of us and a lot of us a whole lot simpler or a whole lot less what we're going to do is we're going to apply a suction to the static system. We're going to apply it gently. And then we're going to clamp and hold the, uh, uh, hold the system. Any change will indicate a leak. And then we're going to release it gently. Okay. Uh, leaks in the static system. And the reason you, you know, we, we want to be able to do this, the leaks in the static system are the primary cause of altimeter problems. Uh, we had a Blanick in our club that, uh, you know, the instructors were saying it doesn't seem right. What I'm seeing on the airspeed indicator doesn't seem right. We put uh, one of these water manometers on it, measured it, and found out that the uh, static system was leaking badly and we ended up having to replace all of the tubing, all of the flexible tubing that has hard tubing that comes forward from the uh, aft static ports. And then it has flexible tubing that comes up and feeds the two cock the instruments in the two cockpits. And we ended up having to replace all of that flexible tubing. Uh, one thing, if you've got an altimeter that's mounted in the moving part of the canopy, you know, so if you open your canopy and it lifts the instrument panel, be careful. The brass gears in the Kalsman adjustment mechanism are very delicate, and you don't want to bang the canopy either into its up stop or to its down stop uh, because that can shock the gears. And then you'll find yourself at an instrument shop paying a couple of hundred dollars to get those things replaced. So, water manometer. So it's a U-shaped tube right here, and it comes off. The tube right here goes off to the aircraft. For this one, since I'm going to pull a suction on it, I have a 60 cc uh, syringe at the top of this tube. There is a uh, uh, fluid in the tube. In this case, all it is is water with a little blue food coloring and a couple of drops of uh, dish soap in there. Uh, the dish soap helps with the meniscus, the curve that you get on the top of a water column when you look at it. The white card over here on the left is an airspeed card. You'll see that when we test the airspeed indicator. There's a bulb over here that goes into a T that's used to pressurize when we're testing altimeters, the pitot system. And then the uh, syringe, like I say up here, we're going to use for uh, pulling a vacuum in the line so that we can test the uh, altimeter. When you hook up your syringe up here, make sure that it is fully, uh, that the, that it's fully pressed in because you do not want to push pressure into the static system on your aircraft. So we're going to test the uh, altimeter down here. The general procedure in uh, 431B 
is to pull a vacuum for a thousand feet above ambient. For the water column systems, that's 14 and a half inches of water. I don't have 14 and a half inches of travel over here and my 60 cc syringe won't pull 14 and a half inches anyway. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull this up about 250 feet. That's only about six inches of rise on this side. The procedure, the FAA's procedure will uh, say that you hold the vacuum for one minute and if the loss is less than 100 feet, the static system is considered satisfactory, okay? I know I said five minutes a little while ago, but when I'm troubleshooting and walking around the plane and wiggling hoses and stuff like that, I leave it connected for a lot longer. All right, so this is what the, uh... oh, hang on a second. Got to get to the directory that has it in it. So, yeah. yeah, you can see me moving around in the plane trying to get over to the manometer. I'm starting to pull the vacuum. You can see the fluid rising over here and you can see it come up. And uh, we only came up about 150 feet, not 250 feet. So you can see it. We're going to hold it for a period of time. Notice that this has got a nice seal on it. Uh, it is acceptable in the procedure to uh, run this with a uh, uh, sorry I just lost train of thought <laughs> so we'll go back alrighty so that's the static system check and uh, like I say if you had more you know, if I had a, a small vacuum pump with a plenum on it that I could use a needle valve on to control the, the pressure in and the pressure out uh, very easily, you would pull this up a thousand feet, clamp it off, hold it for uh, a minute or longer. And as long as it doesn't drop more than a hundred feet, that static system is considered acceptable. Uh, the way you connect to the static system is either put an adapter over a port and tape off any vents or any uh, uh, water drains and your other static ports and pull it that way. Or you can come in on an alternate static port or you can come in on a T that's in the static system that's then sealed off after you uh, do the static test. So that's what a static test looks like on it. Now, <clears throat> your decision aid, here's what, here's what the altimeter is doing for you. Um, you're going to measure your static pressure, static atmospheric pressure, and we've got a barometric uh, pressure reference. We're going to convert that pressure data to an altitude. In our case, it's going to be a visual representation of the altitude MSL. And the decision that we're working with is, do we have the proper altitude? Okay, we fly day VFR. So the question that you have, you know, when you're trying to evaluate, is this enough information for me to make decisions with? So what's good enough? First point, our altimeter is there on us. It's a safety instrument. So one of the things that you have to decide is, uh, do I look at the instrument or do I look outside? Well, if I'm at 12,000 feet looking outside, I'm not going to be able to tell much between 12,000 and 14,000 feet. So the instrument's doing a whole lot for me there. However, if I'm coming back into the airport and our airport is at 7,000 feet above sea level, field elevation is 7,000 feet above sea level. And if I'm at 1,500 feet and a half mile west of my airport, uh, I can get 
pretty much most of what I need to know, uh, unless, you know, except for hitting the pattern altitude, I can get that by looking outside. And then as I get close to the pattern and I'm going to enter the pattern, then I have the altimeter saying, yeah, you know, I'm at pattern altitude. Okay. So the decision aid here is taking this pressure measurement or pressure, uh, pressure and the reference, converting it to altitude, displaying it in front of us as altitude MSL, and we can determine whether we're at the proper altitude. Okay, so now, airspeed indicator. With the airspeed indicator, we, there are a number of airspeeds. Uh, you probably all learned this when you were working on your private license or a later license. It gets repeated over and over. So we have indicated airspeed, which is what we see on the airspeed indicator. That is the next one is calibrated airspeed. So that's indicated airspeed caliber, uh, corrected for position installation error. And then we have equivalent airspeed, which is calibrated airspeed corrected for compressibility. And then we have true airspeed, which is equivalent airspeed corrected for temperature and pressure altitude. Okay, not that you really have to, but an easy way to remember this is the acronym ICE-T, which are the letters for indicated, calibrated, equivalent, and true. Um, compressibility was something that they discovered during the Second World War. Uh, that created some interesting things for them. Uh, you think about that and you're thinking about fighter aircraft that are three, five, three, four, and 500 knots, but compressibility does start to show up around 100 knots. The airspeed indicator altitude error can be roughly estimated as indicating about 2% less than true airspeed per thousand feet above sea level. Okay, so for example, a plane flying at 15,000 feet in an international standard atmosphere, of course, when, when do you ever see that, with an indicated airspeed of 100 knots is actually flying at 126 knots true airspeed. Okay. Now, in the cockpit, what are we using true airspeed for? Eh, you know, we're talking indicated air, you know, we're working with indicated airspeed we may use true airspeed for some other things, but you know, we when we get an estimate of the ground speed based on our winds and that kind of thing, basically that's when we're going to see uh, the effect of the true airspeed. Okay, now the fun part: airspeed indicator, primarily safe operation of the aircraft. Now, the airspeed indicator that I'm showing is one that's commonly seen in a glider. It's one and a half turns, so zero is down here somewhere, comes around, and when you come back and you wrap in, it goes to the inner scale. Okay. So it's zero at the overlap. So zero would be right here, even though it's not shown on the, it's not specifically marked. It's a nonlinear scale. Notice that we've got a much larger gap between 20 and 30 knots than what we've got between 60 and 70 knots, and definitely than what we have between 100 and 110 knots. Okay, and in this case, we're talking about, uh, in this case, we are talking knots. Now, our aircraft come in, usually uh, they have some kind of ESA certification. ESA certification is currently done under CS22. Uh, some of you are probably old enough that you remember JAR22, which was used by uh, the LBA in Germany before uh, before they, you know, consolidated all of this data across the nation states, the various nation states in Europe. In CS22, the bottom of the white arc right here is 1.1 VSO and, or I'm sorry, yeah, bottom of the white arc. And then the bottom of the green arc is 1.1 VS1, okay? Whereas with the FAA, 
So if you have a aircraft that has a altimeter in it that is marked, uh, it's not just a conversion from knots or from uh, the metric system to the imperial system. It's truly marked as per a U.S. type certificate then the bottom of the uh, white arc is VSO and the bottom of the green arc is VS1. So for the, uh, for certification uh, under CS22, the positive flap operating range, the lower limit is 1.1 VSO in landing condition configuration at max weight. And the normal operating range, the green arc, is the lower limit is 1.1 VS1 at maximum weight and most forward CG with flaps neutral. Okay, that's the that's the uh, certification definition. For the FAA, VSO means stalling speed or minimum steady flight speed in the landing configuration. VS1 means stalling speed or minimum steady speed in a specific configuration. Generally, VS1 is a clean configuration. So what you have to do with this is you've got to check the flight manual for what the markings are supposed to mean for the glider you're flying. Now, most of us uh, are flying uh, gliders that are coming in from Europe or uh, coming in from uh, South Africa. So, you know, just take a look. The uh, stall speeds. So looking at it from a CS22 perspective, you've got a clean and dirty max gross weight and forward CG limit on a uh, uh, for CS22. So the uh, VS1 shown on this chart is 37 knots. So 1.1 would be 41 knots. So for VS1, we're at 41 knots right here. For VSO, the uh, stall speed is 32 knots. So VS, uh, so the VSO, the bottom of the white arc, is 1.1, and so it's at 36 knots. Okay, so there is a margin built in over the straight and level stall speed when you're looking at it from the uh, uh, from the European certification standards. The yellow triangle is your, you know, think of the yellow as a warning. For JAR-22 and CS-22, the wording is exactly the same. A quote, the yellow marking triangle for the lowest approach speed at maximum weight without water recommended by the manufacturer. Um, okay, this is not your pattern speed. This is your, you know, once you're stabilized on final, this is the speed that you're going to base that approach speed from stabilized on final. So this is the speed that you're going to adjust for headwinds and crosswinds and stuff like that. But if it's a no wind situation, then once you're stabilized on final, this is the minimum speed recommended. Okay. And the yellow triangle under CS22 is at 1.4 VSO, okay? Now I'm gonna come back and say it again, and I probably will keep repeating it. Check the flight manual for your glider to be sure of what the yellow, that the yellow triangle means, what you think it means for your glider. The markings on an airspeed indicator, okay? The white arc bottom at 1.1 VSO and the maximum positive flap extension speed. So in this case, it comes all the way around to here. Notice that we've got values in here for landing a, a positive two and a positive one setting. So this kind of looks like a shimp hearth airspeed indicator. Um, and then zero setting and to full negative, you don't have a limitation unless the uh, flight manual puts a limitation on you. The green arc, the normal operating range runs, the lower limit is V 1.1 VS1. 
and that's at maximum weight, most forward CG and flaps neutral. And then it wraps around to uh, VRA, so the rough airspeed. The uh, Europeans do it a little differently than the uh, U.S. does in terms of the marking. Again, remember the difference between the definition of v, uh, VSO and VS1. And the uh, then you have the caution range starting at the top of the green arc all the way up to the red line. This is smooth air only. And then the red line is never exceed. Okay, so that was markings, the V speeds. So 1.1 VSO, bottom of the green arc, 1.1 VS1. VY, if you've got a motor glider, whether it's a sustainer or self-launcher, you will have a blue line. The blue line is the best rate of climb, VY. And that'll only be, that marking will only be in a powered glider. Okay. And then VFE, so this is the top of the white arc. That's the maximum for positive extension of the flaps. Okay. Now, what you will find, you notice like this one has a VFE of uh, just under 80 knots. If you're in flat positive position one in this particular glider, if you're in positive position two, you're down here at about 68 knots. And if you're in the L position, then you're down here at about 61 or 62 knots. Okay. So that's one of the things that you need to check because the uh, certification requirements allow the uh, manufacturer to put those kind of limits. Uh, and for instance, like on a ASW 27 with the 38 degree flaps, you know, you're not going to want to try to fly the thing at 80 knots with that much flap hanging out, even if you were allowed to. Okay, again, yellow arc, green and yellow arcs. Um, one of the things that you have to remember when you're in the uh, green arc, when you come around here to the top, CS-22 calls it VRA for rough air, and FAA calls it VNO, so it's the maximum speed for normal operations. What you have to remember is that at when you're uh, in this area, you can get atmospheric conditions that can exceed the structural limitations of the plane. And the thing that you have to be careful of is rough air speeds if you can get higher accelerations if you're less than max gross weight okay so just just something to keep in the back of your head the uh, so the red line is always never exceed airspeed into air speeds that are not on the airspeed indicator your landing gear your maximum to extend and the maximum speed for when extended. That's in your flight manual. Maximum speed to extend spoilers and maximum speed to fly when the spoilers are extended. Some aircraft will allow you to fly with your spoilers extended all the way up to redline. Maneuvering speed. Maneuvering speed is generally below the VNO or this VRA right here, okay? It ties to the acceleration that can be induced in the airframe when you do control inputs. Remember that we have, uh, you know, you get into the yellow arc and you're supposed to limit how much of the control deflection you use. And when you're up around red line, you're limited even more on how much control deflection you can use. Well, the reason behind that is because with the forces involved, if you were to do a full aileron deflection up around red line, you may be able to actually generate enough force to break your airplane. Okay, so you got to, it depends. You know, I mean, this is one of those that, uh, it's a wonderful little gray area that you have to be familiar with the limitations associated with your aircraft.
Okay. The uh, DRA is the tur uh, turbulent penetration speed. If you've got a retractable engine, so that the VRA is if you're a U.S. aircraft and you don't, and uh, because VRA is defined differently on U.S. aircraft, so that one's not displayed. Whereas under CS22, VRA and very often VA are the same, the same entity, and it's defined at the boundary between the uh, normal operating and the smooth air operation. Retractable engine. This is also another airspeed that's not shown the max speed that you can extend the engine, the max speed that you can have, the uh, that you can do with the engine ex uh, operating. And then there's another one which may be in there, which is the max speed that you can fly with the engine not operating. Again, that's, you know, in the operating manual. Performance issue or performance items are not on your airspeed indicator. So minimum sync and best, over, best L over D are generally not uh, on your airspeed indicator. That's not part of the certification requirements. Red line. Okay. There's fun things that happen around the red line. So basically, what are the certification rules? For most of our gliders, we actually have multiple red lines associated with the density altitude at which we're flying. In the United States, the red line is based on the service ceiling of the aircraft, and the service ceiling is generally defined as it's adjusted to a standard, uh, standard atmospheric conditions under which the rate of climb for the aircraft drops to 100 feet per minute. Okay, that's for an airplane. That doesn't mean anything to us in gliders. For Europe, under CS22, they do the certification work at an altitude. So that may be 3,000 meters. So the manufacturer then provides a table in the handbook, and it is – and. Under the latest revisions of CS22, it's required to be uh, somewhere near the airspeed indicator that will tell you what the maximum, what the red line decreases to as you increase your altitude. So if your aircraft was certified at, if the certification work was at 3,000 meters, anytime you're flying above 3,000 meters, <clears throat> okay, and so we're only talking you know, rough, somewhere between 9,800 and 10,000 feet, anytime you're above 9,800, say 9,800 feet, then your red line should start to decrease in terms of the indicated airspeed for that red line. A real quick check is if you said, what's the true airspeed for the certification altitude? And then with increasing altitude, you decrease it by 2,000 feet Per, or 2% per 1,000 feet above that elevation. Okay, now the nice thing is CS22 says you got to have a chart. So you'll have a chart somewhere, like this is for a discus, duo discus, and I don't know which model, I don't remember which model I pulled this from. So certification altitude was 2,000 meters, so roughly 6,500 feet at 262.8 kilometers per hour or 142 knots. So if you're at 3000 meters, your red line has decreased to 137 knots indicated. If you're at 4000 meters, well, the heck with it. let's just skip down here to 6000 meters. Okay, so we don't go above 18,000 feet generally, but notice that the red line has decreased from 142 knots down to 116 knots. On this airframe, the VNO, the VA, and the VRA is 97 knots. Okay, that one's not changing. What's changing is the red line. So that's how, how wide is that yellow arc? So your yellow arc went from 97 to 142 knots down to 97 to 116 knots with altitude. Now, this is for Aventus BT. I happen to own one of these, and so I 
wanted to see what the numbers were for it. Interestingly enough, in 1980, whatever, when they did the certification on the Venice BT, the numbers were at 5,000 meters, so a little over 16,000 feet. So my decrease from 135 knots when I get up to the 19 or to 6,000 meters is to 134 knots. And my VA, VRA is 102. So, you know, I don't fly that fast in that plane anyway. Okay. Airspeed limitations. Again, this is talking about the red line. And the reason I'm focusing on this is an awful lot of people like to fly uh, up into the yellow arc. Um, and that's fine. I'm not saying that you can't do it. But I also want you to be sure that you understand what these numbers mean and, and uh, what the implications are. So when they're setting V&E, the uh, all flight speeds are stated in terms of airspeed indicated readings, so indicated airspeed. The never exceed speed must not exceed 90% of the demonstrated, the VDF, the demonstrated flight speed in test. Okay, so you have a, your VNE. If your VNE, like uh, the VNE in my uh, Ventus, is 135 knots at 5,000 meters, and that gives me 10% margin up to the airspeed that they demonstrated when they did the certification. So there's a 10% margin. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can run up to the demonstrated speed. That just means that, you know, stretches in or, you know, you know, stretches in cables or in bearings and stuff like that that aren't as tight as they used to be doesn't, if I'm up near V&E, that doesn't mean that I'm automatically uh, super dangerous. Doesn't mean go there, but it means I've got some margin. This design demonstrated design speed has to be less than the design speed of the aircraft, but it has to be within that. It has to be within ten percent. So generally, there will be less than a ten percent margin between the demonstrated airspeed and the design speed for the structure. Okay. Now, where does this come in? All right. The big bugaboo, especially for flexible structures, is flutter. So the certification requirements is that it has to be free from flutter, airfoil divergence, control reversal in all configurations and at each appropriate speed up to at least the airframe design speed. And there has to be sufficient dampening in the structure so that it will, if there is a vibration, it will die away rapidly. And of course, rapidly, you got to go look at the, the equations and stuff that they're using. And they have a paragraph that has all kinds of compliance methods that allow you to do this either by demonstrating or by doing it by analysis and stuff like that. So the glider isn't likely to fall apart if you hit V and E. However, flutter is a real consideration and rudder can destroy the glider. I went through this one time, uh, one of my earlier presentations on this, and I had somebody come up and say, but flutter is ancient history. Flutter is not ancient history. Flutter should not occur below V and E. However, there are causes that could be in the design or the construction technique. However, those should be discovered and eliminated during the by engineering and during the certification process. However, you may have damage to the aircraft that's not apparent until the airframe flutters. Uh, go search on YouTube for Gordon McDonald. He is uh, a senior uh, airframe airworthiness person for the British Gliding Association. And he's got videos out there on uh, inspecting aircraft. He had a label that the owner reported that he was getting flutter below 
uh, V and E on high speed glides in the tail. And you go watch the video and it's really interesting because it turns out that at some point the aircraft had gotten damaged and one of the fuselage formers back by in front of the rudder had broken loose on one side from the inside skin of the glider. Um, you know, so this can happen. Uh, there was no external, there was no apparent external damage to the aircraft. They finally got a hint when they used a stethoscope and tried to flex the vertical fin with the fuselage locked into a position on uh, saw horses. And then they went in with a, a little bore scope. The other one, oh, and by the way, it was interesting because I found out that the glider in that video belongs to a friend of mine in uh, Great Britain. And I'm going, wow. <laughs> uh, the other one is there may be maintenance issues. Okay, now the one Gordon McDonald refers to is that there was there was damage to the aircraft and the normal annual inspection did not find the aircraft damage. It was only after some other symptom made them look further. The other one is, is that you can get into trouble with improperly maintained control systems. Uh, years ago, I had a Concept 70 and um, somebody had refinished the rudder, which I didn't know. And it wasn't documented in the logbook. As far as I knew, the paint scheme that was on the rudder is what it came out of the factory with. And I was running back into the airport uh, at about 17,000 feet above sea level and running well up into the yellow arc and hit a little bit of turbulence and the rudder started fluttering. It was a rather unnerving experience. And when we uh, took it down to the maintenance shop, and pulled the rudder off. Basically, uh, the rudder had been refinished and the control surface was not balanced. And I can't really complain too much about that because we're talking about a 1970s glider and back in 19, that time period, uh, there was an awful lot of things about, well, control surfaces for an aircraft below 120 knots don't need to be balanced. So I'm not pointing fingers and saying somebody didn't do their job, but we found out that it really needed to be balanced and it took uh, it took a fair amount of lead ahead of the uh, pivot point to get it to balance. Uh, later on, I did the actual true repair and I took it down to a shop and we reskinned the rudder and uh, managed to take out a whole bunch of weight out of that system. So flutter is not ancient history. So I've got two videos on airframe flutter that we'll go through. The first one, is the uh, S9, SB9 glider from the Afliglag, Af, uh, never mind, the German uh, uh, aviation education uh, system in uh, Germany for aeronautical engineers. The SB9 first took its first flight in uh, January of 1969. The wings were built in fully negative molds with uh, rigid foam as the supporting material instead of balsa. So this is uh, one of the early uses of foam instead of balsa as the core for the wing skins. Uh, this is the SB9 you see behind the tow plane. She had 22 meter span wings. Uh, and it was uh, with outer panels that were two meters long each. They later shortened them by a half meter down to 21 meters so they could raise the uh, max permissible speed of the aircraft. During flight testing, there was fluttering phenomenon, which was captured on film because they were, they were uh, videoing or filming, not videoing, they were filming back then. And it was interesting because the, uh, the flutter is... Uh, The flutter is, well, let's just go uh, grab this and take a look. I don't know if you can hear the comments in the background, but how's that for having a flutter in your aircraft? Okay. So we are, uh, uh, 
the interesting thing is that they found that the flutter problems, they were able to eliminate the flutter problems uh, by using an aileron mass balance. Um, and the other thing that I found interesting is they took this wing, they took the wings off of this aircraft, put it on the next generation, the SB-10. And the note on the uh, website for this thing says that they got several thousands of hours on those wings, even after what we just observed. This one is interesting. Uh, this is going to have. This is going to be a different uh, phenomenon. This is a DG three hundred again uh, in the uh, uh, university system in the university uh, uh, aerodynamic or aeronautical engineering program. Uh, it's a DG three hundred that they modified to seventeen meter span. Uh, they added the uh, wingspan by putting. Uh, spacers in at the wing root so they put an adapter in there to carry the load and stuff so they didn't just extend it by putting wing tips on it um when we what we're going to be seeing when we look at it is the aircraft was between uh 140 and 150 kilometers an hour so up around 90 miles an hour and uh they were uh, intentionally testing. They put huge water tanks in this thing, and they were intentionally testing uh, with a heavy load in the wing. Uh, one of the things that they did, uh, the uh, modeling that they were doing at this time, uh, fairly rudimentary, uh, but, you know, early computer modeling with it. And so they had, in, they were trying to prove, or they were trying to validate the model. Did it did it go into flutter uh, in flight test under the conditions that the model was predicting? And then the uh, uh, they also had a uh, recommended recovery procedure. So this was testing the model and it was testing the recovery procedures. So we'll go uh, go look at that. And okay. Um, that would be uh, that would be more exciting than what I would want, but having been through that before. Uh, with the rudder. It's not something I would want to play with. And by the way, uh, the uh, the flutter started, they did the proper, you know, they got it established, got it stable. Uh, they It didn't increase because they had come up with uh, locking the stick so that the stick didn't oscillate left and right or forward and back. And it was specifically tested to see if it would respond as the structural models predicted, and the aircraft did. But, you know, these things will flutter. One of the things that they're working with on the Perlin is with the Perlin, they're actually building uh, exciters into the wing, into the structure of the wing. You can see these little weights right here. And these oscillate and they can change the frequency and they can change the uh, amplitude of the oscillation. Part of this again is to validate their models because they have the models which said, uh, okay, we're designing for an aircraft that can go to 90,000 feet. Uh, what happens if we get some flutter as we're flying up there? Will it behave the way the models predicted? Which also tells you, you know, by the way, that uh, you know, if they go to 100,000 feet, they've gone 10,000 feet above where the, uh, d uh, above their design, above their design uh, goal. So.
the uh, scale on the little display there, the top was uh, bending, the bottom was twist. Uh, what it was across the scale was the uh, hertz, so the frequency that was being introduced. So the whole idea was to uh, be able to stimulate the wing while they were in the air at the reduced atmospheric pressures or at the reduced atmospheric density. And uh, one of the things they did is they data linked it real time down to the ground in case uh, they weren't able to collect the data from the instrument in the aircraft. All right, so we've talked about what we see, you know, on the, uh, uh, what we see on the markings on the airspeed indicator. We've talked about the importance of the limits that are marked on the airspeed indicator. And so now here is a quick little cartoon on how the uh, airspeed indicator works. Again, remember airspeed indicators are calibrated at sea level under at standard atmospheric conditions. If they're in any other kind of conditions, then there are errors. So we've got pitot pressure coming in to a capsule. Again, another little elastic capsule. We have static pressure, which is brought in to the inside of the instrument case outside the capsule. We've got a rack and pinion in this simplified uh, uh, altimeter. And uh, so the the case is airtight, the capsule is airtight, and so pressure increases on this side, the capsule swells, the rack and pinion moves, the needle moves. When we're looking at the pitot tube, it's often mounted in the glider nose. Um, you know, that gets it pretty well exposed to the airflow, or nicely exposed to the airflow. However, again, you can have pitot back here uh, on a probe on the vertical fin. Again, most, obvious, most often for instruments, uh, but again, for some aircraft, that also may be your primary airspeed uh, pitot installation is on the, on the uh, probe that's on the vertical tail. So, pitot tube. Remember, we're talking pressure, not flow, okay? So we have the pitot tube. We got the capsule inside the uh, airspeed indicator. And we're at, you know, we're sitting, uh, the pressure is, you know, we're not pushing, we're not moving. So it's got the atmospheric pressure on both sides. So it's sitting at zero. We speed up to 30 knots. So our capsule pressure is instead of 3013 millibars or 1013 millibars is now 1015 millibars. Two millibars. Remember how small I said one millibar is PSI? Two millibars and we are at 30 knots. Also remember that I said the uh, pressures are not all, they're not linear. So let's go up to 60 knots. Notice that we've only got six millibars. And I didn't believe that this was right. And I found the equations for it. And I sat down and cranked through the equations and found out, yeah, this is right. Okay. Um, it's not always a tube that's out, the, that's out the nose. There may be a opening. For instance, the DG300 has a chamber, a plenum chamber up here behind, but in the nose and the pressure in the plenum chamber is tapped off and brought back as opposed to having a tube directly impinged on the uh, pressure coming in. So they've got a little chamber right here and that tube connects to the chamber. You will find that on some Shemp hearth gliders with the nose uh, pitot tube, when you retrofit the uh, nose uh, tow hook, that when you're connected to the uh, tow plane through the tow hook, that your uh, airspeed readings are, it interferes with the airspeed readings. Okay. So again, be sure you understand your aircraft 
the installation in your aircraft and the implications of that installation. So for instance, putting a nose, having a nose hook retrofitted to a, a shimp hearth glider that didn't have it may give you uh, airspeed problems while you're connected, while you're on tow. And again, I'm just pointing out the uh, how small of a pressure differential we're talking about. Never seal your lips on the pitot tube and blow. Okay, so the pitot tube installation. So pitot tube in the nose, the static vents back here, the instrument in the middle. And uh, so you can see, again, we talked about this, the capsule when the pressures are equal, the capsule when you have the dynamic pressure coming in. So this time we're going to talk about, you know, this is the same reference you saw before. Uh, this time when we're looking at it, our, uh, we're going to use the water manometer again. We're going to apply pressure. It's going to come in gently. We're going to hold it and clamp for five minutes, and then we're going to release gently. The problem areas for uh, airspeed are, in addition to leaks, which is the greatest problem for uh, uh, the static side, one of the problems uh, on the airspeed is you get clocks uh, because you've got a tube. Uh, I was flying a plane. I was checking out on a plane down at Moriarty one time a long time ago, and uh, the plane had sat in the trailer, hadn't been out of the trailer for a while. And when we got it out um, and uh, started to take off roll and I had no airspeed indication, I got off, you know, I released immediately, rolled to a stop. We got the plane off to the side and found out that mud daubers had built a nest in the, uh, in the uh, pitot tube and had to take it over to the shop and get it cleaned out. And once it was cleaned out, everything worked just fine. But you also get clogs showing up for airspeed. So again, the, uh, the manometer, notice that the syringe is now gone. And uh, when you get the next picture, you'll have a better view of the card right here. So everything is uh, the same other than now we're going to pressurize in the middle. So here's the airspeed indicator. You'll see the water come up. Uh, for the column of water that we're using, it is calibrated in knots over here on the right-hand side. And uh, so the simplified procedure from 4313-1B uh, is to connect to the pitot system. They say apply pressure for 150 knots. I used 140 because that was just below the red line on this. Uh, you hold the pressure again uh, for one minute and if the loss is less than 10 knots then the pitot system is considered satisfactory now one of the things that i'll say is that i've when i'm doing this on the gliders most the vast majority of the time with the gliders i'm able to do it and have no leakage whatsoever so here we go on this So you can see the airspeed coming up and you can see the fluid rising. I paused to make sure that I had a pretty good seal and then I'm going to bring it on up. In general, for most, uh, most instruments, a safe rate is uh, one knot per second. And I'm, but I'm squeezing a blood pressure bulb and I will change this later for some time. The line that it's at over here on the uh, right hand side of the tube is right at just under the 140 knot. So everything is where it should be and there was no leakage in this installation.
The instrument uh, water manometer is fairly easy to build if you wanted to make one for your club. Uh, Dick Johnson in his, I think it was August 1989, but I don't have the note in front of me, uh, had an article, I let it go way too fast there, um, had an article in that magazine on how he did instrument uh, checks. And one of the things that he showed was building a water manometer that wasn't a u-shape like this one is but was on a 45 degree uh, the other one is you can go search uh, uh, some of the eaa or kit plane magazines and you'll find the one that's like this and it will also have a printout that you can use to use for your uh, scale but this, having these instruments or having the manometer to work with the instruments we had a gentleman in our club that had a uh, that got a new glider or got a new old glider and had been sitting in the hang or in the trailer for a long time. And he flew it and he said, the airspeed's not right. We put the manometer on it and found out that he had a leak in one of his tubes. So uh, not something that you'd have to do at every annual inspection or even very often. But if you notice something that seems funny, this is a nice, simple little tool to make. And we keep this one down at our club. So anybody can take it and go use it to see, uh, how things are working. Okay, so as our decision aid, we're going to measure. We're going to be measuring static atmospheric pressure. We're going to be measuring dynamic uh, air pressure, which by its nature includes the static air pressure. We're going to convert this uh, pressure information into airspeed, and we're going to give a uh, visual presentation of airspeed on the airspeed indicator with limits marked and the decision that we're trying to support is you know are we at the proper airspeed for you know our particular phase of flight okay uh, one thing uh, about this depending on your aircraft you know we're all taught to be able to cover our airspeed indicator and fly the pattern because we're flying pitch attitude and that works very well with a standard class glider, and it works pretty well with a glider that has uh, uh, fl uh, landing flaps that are in the 12, maybe 15 degree range. If you're flying a glider that's got 90 degree flaps, my Concept 70 had 90 degree flaps, a 135 has 80 or 90 degree flaps, a Schweitzer 135, uh, ASW 26, 27, and I'm assuming the ASG-29 all have 40 degree flaps. You've got large deflection, at which point you have a large pitch change when you go to full landing flap. Um, you know, you really want the airspeed system to be working correctly. Okay, one of the things that's real important, uh, you know, I said air, uh, altimeter and airspeed are safety of flight, and they are. The other thing that happens is because we are flying in the national airspace system, primary altitude and airspeed indications must derive from the approved pedo and static sources that the manufacturer has identified for the aircraft. Um, because that's one where the certification was done and the other one is that's the place that's guaranteed to show is supposed to be guaranteed to show the correct airspeed and altitude uh, when you use those ports. All right, wandering off into uh, variometers. What we have with variometers is we have uncompensated variometers, total energy compensated variometers, a netto or air mass variometer, and then a relative netto or super netto variometer. And what it's doing is, well, we'll get to it, but these are our general four classes of variometers. So a variometer in general, uh, you know, it kind of looks like an airspeed indicator, except in what's feeding the uh, chamber or the capsule is a capacity and this basically is acting as a pressure memory we have the static outlet that comes in 
and later we'll connect it to a total energy probe but we so we've got static pressure on this side and we have pressure history over here and what they've done is they have put a calibrated leak in the capsule and this calibrated leak allows the pressure exchange from the memory with the current so if the pressure is higher here it's going to push in or pressure is higher here than the caps or than the memory then the memory is going to bleed out and this chat capsule is going to shrink and the needle is going to show uh, you going down if the pressure is uh, less out here than it is in here the capsule is going to expand and it's going to show a climb Okay, and the key for the mechanical for the analog instruments is this little leakage. Uh, the early electrical systems changed this little uh, used the leakage, but it used a different detection mechanism to drive the gear train. So this is a rate of change instrument. And so we've got Pressure stored over here as this was the, our memory from a few seconds ago. This is what's happening right now. And the rate of exchange between the memory and what's happening right now is what moves the needle. Fast or slow depends on the internal construction of the variometer, the analog variometer. So, you know, that's where the uh, SAGE variometers were known for their performance is because this mechanism was very tightly controlled along with the gear train mechanism. Okay. An averager is really just a very slow variometer. So instead of responding in one to three seconds with the exchange right here, they're responding in 20 to 30 seconds. So the installation for a straight uncompensated variometer, we've got a capacity flask. Very often the capacity flask is insulated so that it doesn't respond, its pressures don't respond to temperature. Uh, they finally ended up going to a molded foam uh, flask. And then here's the instrument and then we're tied back to the static ports. Okay, so this is uncompensated. The uh, Nice and simple. So if we're at 900 millibars in the memory and 900 millibars in our little world, it's not showing any rate of change. If our memory is at 984 or 894 and we're 892 out here, so we're lower pressure out here, we must be climbing. And so it's going to expand and move the needle. Okay, so roughly 3,500 feet during a climb from three to 4,000 feet was what that was set up with. So we're going to take stored atmospheric pressure, and we're going to take the static atmospheric pressure. We're going to convert the pressures to a direction and rate of change for, the, for altitude. We're going to give a visual representation of a climb or descent and the rate. And so the decision that we're working with is, is the glider sinking or rising? And what is the quality of the thermal? So, you know, seat of the pants or the instrument. Now, once it's established in a, uh, you know, you're stabilized in a climb, once you're established in a stabilized climb, you know, you were talking about the quality of the climb. Would it be better if I moved over to the left or right a little bit? You know, that kind of thing. A total energy variometer, one of the problems with a main, with an uncompensated variometer is if I pull the stick and I climb the glider, then the pressure is going to decrease. I haven't really climbed uh, as a result of the atmosphere. I've just climbed because I'm trading airspeed for altitude. Okay. So that's what we call a stick thermal. What total energy compensation does is it allows us to remove the effect of pilot-induced stick thermals. So if we've got the natural way to sink of the glider and we climb and descend, but if I'm running along at 80 knots and I pull back, I'm going to climb 
but that's not because of a thermal. I climbed because I went from 80 knots down to 50 knots, and I, and the trade of that energy was f for altitude. So when we're looking at energy, we have potential energy. That's possessed by a body. It's by virtue of what it is, okay? The circumstances under which it is. Kinetic energy is it's associated with the body being in motion. So total is the sum of all of the energies that a body can have. So now, potential. It's related to altitude. Kinetic. It's related to the square of the airspeed. So when we have total, we get altitude combined with the airspeed. The exchange of speed for altitude, you know, by the way, all of this is a lossy conversion. Okay, so there are losses associated with this. So what we want is we want to see the rate of change. Uh, we want to know whether or not we're actually in rising air. Okay, so we, we want to see if the change is due to the atmosphere as opposed to just due because we changed it with the, we changed the airspeed. So what we end up doing here is... Uh, we add a TE probe. So rather than running it to the static probe here, we run it to TE probe back here. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And so we have the capacity and the variometer and we have the static inlet, but now we're gonna, instead of stopping at the static port right here, we're gonna take it back and put it on a port in the tail. Every once in a while, you're gonna find a glider that's got a taped over hole right here. And that's because there used to be uh, a TE probe uh, I've always heard it called a Nix tube. I uh, named for, uh, I think it was Oren Nix. And he came up with the idea of mounting a tube vertically right here with possibly a cant at the top of the tube. Uh, and for instance, my Concept 70, that's where the uh, total energy probe was. And basically, this is a refit uh, location when you add total energy to a glider, whereas this one is one that's built in unless you want to spend a bunch of money with your mechanic. The other alternative for uh, TEs is to possibly put diaphragms and additional function uh, plumbing on the line between the capacity and the variometer. And that's a very old attempt to do this without sensing the uh, external you know, it basically was tying in uh, airspeed into it to do uh, compensation right here. So tying in the pitot feed. In general, the bent pipe TE probe is closed at the end and there are vent holes or slots in the trailing edge of the probe. And then this goes back, here's the leading edge of the vertical fin, and then the tube going forward to the static port on the uh, variometer. So basically, it's not quite right, but I'm going to uh, just simplify it. Basically, it's negative dynamic pressure or roughly negative pedo. Okay. Um, if you look at the equations, that's not the that's not the correct definition, but it's a good colloquialism to use for it. It's easy to understand. So in this case, we've got the our stat, stored pressure, and now we have the negative pressure coming from the TE probe, and we're still going to convert the direction and rate of change for altitude compensation. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a, a presentation of compensated climb or descent because by adding by taking into account the airspeed change that's going to change what we're going to see again we're looking for is the glider rising or sinking and once we slow down to thermaling speeds it basically turns into just a, a nice vario so what happens is the uh, uh, te variometer will indicate the actual rate of sync corresponding to the speed that we're flying 
and according to the glider's performance polar. For instance, minus two knots at 82 knots in calm air. Is steady circling speed, then the TE and the uncompensated variometers basically will have the same indication. So what it's doing is uh, it's increasing the, uh, whereas the static was just the surrounding pressure when we were uncompensated. By putting the TE probe on there, we are adding some a, a lower pressure that is now tied to our airspeed. And so if I pull back to slow down, I shouldn't, I shouldn't get a really strong climb indication. I should just see that basically the trade between altitude and airspeed should show that I'm really not, uh, I don't have a, uh, I'm not, I'm not climbing as a result of the atmosphere. Okay. Now, if we go to a netto variometer, it's adjusting for the sink rate of the glider at a given speed. So now we took the uncompensated, we compensated it for airspeed, and now we're going to compensate for the polar curve. We might even add an adjustment in here when we're doing this for the ballast of the aircraft. In a lot of cases, this can be done. Uh, uh, here's This is going to show the difference if I've got a total energy compensated over here and I'm going to apply my polar. And so over here, I'm looking for air mass. So the difference between the TE vario and the netto vario is the air mass movement. So if the air mass is sinking at five knots, what the TE probe is going to show if we're not sinking and if we're climbing. Okay. So the, uh, the key with this so if we're flying at 80 knots, the we should be showing, you know, we're not we're not right, you know, we're in flat air. We should show for the glider I was using for this minus 2.4 knots. Okay. And uh, so if we're less negative, we're climbing. If we're uh, more negative, we're sinking. Over here, if we take this and we're adjusting it. This is your decision aid. So what this means is that at 80 knots, the netto reading is zero. We should be seeing minus 2.4. If we were seeing five knots up, the vario reading should be 2.6. And if we were seeing five knots down, the vario reading should be 7.4 minus 7.4. Okay, this is all based off of my Venice. And so you end up with this little thing in the cockpit that says, if I'm at 80 knots and air mass is zero, then I've got one for air mass at five and one for air mass at whatever. Or I can just keep the numbers in my head and do the arithmetic, uh, you know, based off of this. So if I see plus 2.6, I know I've got, I'm in rising air at five knots. If I see minus seven point, whatever it was, I'm in, or minus 7.4, I'm in uh, sinking air. Okay. So this just tells me what I see at that point. This was an early attempt to improve understanding of uh, what's going on when you're flying, what's happening to the air mass around you, and therefore it can help you make decisions. So if I'm bombing along at 80 knots and I'm seeing something other than minus 2.4, you know, if it's uh, numerically less or, I mean, numerically improved, then I'm over here climbing. And if it's numerically worse, then I'm over here sinking. Okay. Um, this has got you doing mental math in the cockpit. I would prefer not to be doing mental math in the cockpit as we all would, but this is a tool. So now what we're taking is we've got the stored pressure, the negative, dy uh, the negative dynamic pressure. We've got airspeed because we're reading that off the airspeed indicator. We've got the polar and we could add in glider mass to offset the polar if we wanted to. 
All right. So we're going to convert the uh, uh, all of that data to give us an indication of uh, a visual representation of the air mass motion around the glider. And then if we're thermaling, it's just how how well are we doing thermaling? Basically, what we're trying to, what we're getting here is is the air mass around us rising or sinking. And where that comes in is, should I stop in thermal or should I continue on? Okay. Should I slow down? Should I speed up? Okay. That's, that's basically what this is telling you with this knowledge. Now, relative. They came up with the idea uh, that if I could adjust what you were seeing in front of you, and say, what would be the approximate vertical speed of the glider if I slowed to thermaling speed? So basically, now we're going to take that calculated netto reading and subtract the glider's minimum sink. And then over here, this is just in the thermaling case. That's just there for completeness. You know, we already talked about how it behaves there. Now what happens is your, uh, what's happening is it's showing the potential for your rate of climb. So I'm running at 80 knots and uh, my TE is showing minus 1.2. So I've, I'm in lift, the air mass is lifting. I run over here and I find right here, you know, so I can see this. We're, we're if I'm at minus one, two, I can go across here. Um, so here's minus one, four. So the net, you know, this would only be a, uh, this wouldn't really be worth it. I'd still be sinking. But I get over here where the TE rating is 2.6. And if I slow to my thermaling speed, and I apply my polar, you know, my sink rate at my thermaling speed, if my TE vario is showing me 2.6, then if I slowed, I probably could, I might, let's, let's, let's make this even more uh, nebulous. I might be able to see a 3.8 knot climb. So if I'm running along right here, and uh, so my polar, my Thermaling polar is one point minus one point two. I'm at sixty knots, and I have a TE reading of one point six. I might see one point eight knots climb. If I'm running at a hundred knots, and I'm showing minus or I'm showing plus three, I might be able to slow and get six knots. Okay. Again, having this in the uh, in the glider is. Uh, you know, now I've got now I've got a piece of paper and I've got to look things up. But, you know, I could do it with uh, where I say my, uh, you know, my minimum sink rates at two knots. So I end up with something like this that I could put in my glider, I could carry with me. So, if the air mass is not moving, and I see these are these are what I see. And if I'm bombing along at 80 knots and I see 2.6, remember that corresponded to almost four knots of climb, it might be worth for me to slow down and climb here. Okay. That's what this is showing you is it might be worth, you know, slowing down, you know, if I, if I see 2.6 on my, on my Vario instead of the minus two, it might be worth for, while for me to slow down and climb. So basically what I've done is I've set a threshold that if it doesn't go at least 2.6 at 80 knots, I'm not going to stop. Okay. So now we have uh, put in all of this information. We've got this presentation plus the little chart up there by our Vario. And basically what we're trying to do is to say, is it worthwhile to stop in thermal? Okay, so that's the relative netto. 
I'm not a fan of doing a whole lot of arithmetic in the cockpit. I want to have as much data as possible presented to me, you know, this information presented to me in a form that I can make a decision. I don't want to have to add a processing step right here in between that says, oh, okay, add, subtract, multiply, and divide, if I can get away from it. So let's move beyond analog and come up to the early, early to mid-1990s, okay? Cambridge came out with the Cambridge 302. This is using electronic pressure sensors for pitot, static, and total energy. There is no capacity. So basically, it's got little pressure transducers that are converting pressure to electricity, and then they're taking the electricity, converting it to digital value, and doing work on it. This instrument acts as a variometer. It had the capability of acting as a relative netto variometer, or it's sometimes called super netto. It's all kinds of names. And it switches between the modes with airspeed. And then it added, so that's your pointer. So if I'm running above about 60 knots and this thing is up here on, and I've got it set for relative netto and it's sitting up here at three knots, I, in theory, if I slow down to my thermaling speed, rack it up and slow down to my thermaling speed, I may be able to center in three knots. Okay, that, and no longer looking things up in a table, okay. The other thing that's on the display right here, that's my average. So that's going to be my averager. And then it also displays my current McCready setting. So if I'm being adventuresome and I, I crank it up and it has its own altimeter, since it's hooked up to static, it has its own altimeter. So it has an, alti uh, so it has an altitude display. The processing that this box has in it is it has a speed to fly director. So it you put in the polar for your aircraft, you have your McCready setting. And so you're flying, you're bombing along at a particular speed and it will give you either an arrow that says pull up or an arrow that says pull down or push down because you're going too slow for the conditions you're, or you're in, or you're going too fast. You need to slow down and take advantage of some of the lift that's right here. Okay. So it has a speed to, uh, speed to fly director. It does audio output for the Vario and for various alarms, and it can do a speed to fly audio. It can be hooked up to your aircraft so that uh, it can detect, you know, that the air brakes are open when they shouldn't be, or that the gear is up when you want to have it down, you know, that indicates. The other processing that it had in the background, and that was enabled because it's got a GPS receiver and a remote antenna in it, is it had accurate winds and, could, and direction using the GPS and the airspeed data. So that data could be fed over to another instrument. And in fact, uh, Originally, it, this is where the uh, early uh, PDAs, the, com, uh, the uh, Compaq and HP PDAs were used uh, to support soaring. It also included the GPS receiver. And then w along with that, it had an IGC approved flight logger. Okay, so the modern instruments are all electronic sensing and processing. They have multiple information that can be displayed on the front of them. And what is displayed in some cases is configurable. So I could configure this to be just a TE variometer. I can configure it to be a TE variometer, say below 60 knots, and a relative uh, super netto above 60 knots. Okay. Now, this is a 1990s device. It's no longer in production. If you have one and it works, it's fine if you are if you could pick one up that works for a little bit of money that's fine you know you know a little bit of money uh the lx nav varios that you would replace this with are in the thousand dollar plus range so if you could pick this up for a couple of hundred that's probably and it's working 
but recognize that when it breaks, basically there's been some folks that were maintaining them, but we're getting to the point that basically when it breaks, it may not be repairable. Okay. But if you got one and it works, that's great. What are we seeing today? Okay. This is a LXNAV S80. So this is a current production device. Uh, it has flight mode that's configurable. So you can do relative netto vario in cruise. Here's my vario pointer. The gray orange pointer is my vario pointer. And when I slow down the thermal, it's telling me what's happening in the thermal. It's not doing any other offsets for me. Okay. And it can switch based on airspeed or based on GPS saying that you're turning. And so that's configurable. The secret with all of these things is they're endlessly configurable. You've got to figure out a configuration and then be sure you're answering your questions. What decisions do I need to make? So in this instrument, on this arc right here, so this is my climb and this is in meters per second, but you know, again, it's configurable. So here's my variometer. The red diamond is my, very, uh, is my averager. So I'm climbing better than what my average has been so far. I like that. The green T, this is what I was getting average for my last thermal, average bottom to top, okay? The blue triangle, that's my McCready setting. So whoever's flying this one's flying at McCready zero. So, you know, what you would think you would see is, oh, the McCready setting up here at, uh, you know, in this case, if it's McCready zero and his average is, uh, looks like it's uh, one to one and a half, maybe, yeah, about one, and he's currently climbing at two, or she's currently climbing at two, life's good, okay? This one can be configured for a couple of different things. Uh, I have an S8, which is the 57 millimeter diameter version of this. This is an 80 millimeter version. Uh, and I have this configured to be the uh, climb rate that has been observed in the current thermal. So, you know, if I've got a peak up here, but I'm sitting over here, you know, and my average is, you know, so it, 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 it graphically tells me what's been the range of the climbs I've seen in this thermal. Okay. The other thing that's nice is over here, this one is configured from the numbers. This one is configured for airspeed. But the other thing that's nice with this is you can put your speed director, you know, go faster, go slower based on your McCready setting and your current airspeed and what you're seeing about your, uh, what you're seeing about the atmosphere, what the atmosphere is doing. So what that does is that puts a whole lot of information, a whole lot of data in front of you or no, I'm sorry. This is all information. You can make decisions off of this. This isn't just data. This is information. You can make decisions from this. So you could decide that, oh, I'm above my average and I'm above my McCready setting. I'm going to continue to climb. Okay. And this thermal is better than the last thermal I was in. Okay. So this is the kind of thing that the, the modern instruments can do for you. Where do we go from here? Well, there are a lot of people out there that like glass cockpits. The left-hand instrument over here is the LXNAV standalone digital airspeed and altitude indicator. So they call it the ADI, the air data indicator. It has airspeed around the side and you program in your white arc, green arc, yellow arc, red line, uh, your approach speed, you can see there's a blue line right here. So your, your VY, if you've got a motor glider. Um, notice that it's a nonlinear. So in this range, where you might be thermaling versus here, where you might be just bombing along, okay? It also has the ability for you to put the table for the red line in so that the red line decreases as you go up in altitude. So you're not trying to compute that in your head or you're not trying to look at a little chart you've got taped to your instrument panel. Altitude is in the middle. Over here on the right-hand side is, uh, it can be configured as a total energy compensated variometer. 
I use the lower setting right here, not for the uh, Q and H. I use the lower setting for my bus voltage, and I use the upper setting for my uh, uh, Vario because seeing the little purple bar isn't necessarily easy on a 57 millimeter instrument. Um, besides, I know where my airspeed is. It's right there. I don't need another set of numbers right there. So what this does, for instance, my Venice is a Venice BT. Uh, it means I have an engine installation. So I have a blue line and that kind of thing. But my TE probe is blanked by the engine wash when the engine is up by the turbulence from the engine being deployed. And it's definitely blanked when the engine's running. This is connected to my airframe, pedo, and static because it's my airspeed indicator. And uh, so I have a total energy compensated Vario right here for when the engine's running. And by the way, for those of you that don't understand why that's important, is when your engine's running, you can find and use thermals. Okay. So that's kind of nice to have. And so while my uh, 302 is bouncing around because it's connected to the, uh, uh, or my SH connected to my uh, TE probe and is bouncing around because it's got turbulent, this one's nice and smooth for me. Okay. Um, the only problem with this guy is it does not, it does not meet a technical standard order. So you cannot install this as your primary airspeed indicator in a type certificated glider in the United States. Now my Ventus is an experimental glider. And so I can use any airspeed indicator that I want as long as it contains the correct markings and, uh, and it operates correctly. The one in the middle is basically uh, LX Navigation's version of the same instrument. This one's at 80 millimeter diameter. This one is at uh, 57 millimeter diameter. And then over here on the right, this is the instrument that uh, is coming from, oh, by the way, this one is also not a TSO. So it only can go into a uh, experimental category aircraft. It can't go into a type certificated aircraft or an experimental certificate aircraft. I'm sorry. And, um, and then over here on the right, this is a device coming from Air Avionics, the butterfly people that gave us the displays for the uh, early flarms. And what this guy has is it's got an altimeter, and this is a certified altimeter. And then it has control for your radio, and it has control for transponder. Of course, that means you have a radio and a transponder that can have remote control. This device is certified for use in a standard airworthiness aircraft. So what you can see is you can, now, now you have uh, the information on how we, how these instruments work, how we detect it, how it's converted to useful information that you can make decisions with some of the uh, simpler decisions that you try to make using these instruments or using the, yeah, using these instruments. And so at this point, we're over to questions. Yeah, Brandon, you need to unmute if you're talking to me. Yeah, give me one second. I'm just putting one more in there. We have about 11 questions and I'm going to let you look at it here real quick. I summarized them and semi put them in order for you. Ah, okay. Give me just a second. You can disregard everything that I sent you before. I'm going to summarize it right here. Bear with me. The interesting thing as we've gone through this, uh, we've been doing this course since 2016. And since 2020, we added this course online with the uh, assistance of the SSA. And I, I really can't say enough. You know, we, we all wonder sometimes what are the S, what's the SSA doing for us? Well, courses like this are things that 
uh, the SSA is making possible for us to have beyond just the local clubs. Uh, Frank has put up the uh, poll results from our first poll this uh, this evening, so you can scroll through that while we're while uh, Brandon's working on the uh, notes to pass off to me. Trying to get it pasted in here, and it's not letting me paste. So, <laughs> I've been here. Yeah, ju just remember, everybody can hear what you're saying. I understand that. <laughs> Uh, going through the survey, uh, almost all of you are glider pilots. 50% of you are uh, solo cross-country folks. Uh, some of you have instruments ratings, which means you're both uh, power and glider. And uh, most of you see soaring in your future. I'm kind of interested. A lot of us are uh, EAA and AOPA members. There's some... Uh, uh, Civil Air Patrol folks and some uh, uh, model airplane, Academy of Model Aeronautics, and hang gliders. Uh, wow, I'm glad to see the folks from the hang glider community. I, you'd be, I, I would imagine for most clubs, it's that way for most clubs, but we have a whole lot of our members are uh, folks that uh, came over from the hang glider community just simply because their landing gear uh, wore out from uh, the uh, various landings they were having. So uh, this is interesting. And for those of you that are online, we've got, uh, uh, looks like we've got about 160 people online this evening. So I really appreciate you guys. Every, uh, not you guys, I appreciate everyone joining us and, uh, and hanging around for this. Okay. Dave, you should have a couple questions rolling in there. I'm just going to type them out. Won't let me cut and paste. So okay. you should see them rolling in. Okay. Yeah, you can make it easier. You can just read them to me. Sure, let's do it. Um, okay, so the first question is, are there any gliders that don't show airspeed errors in a slip? Um, well, there's there's always an error uh, when the when the pedo is not aligned with the uh, with the airflow. Um, so every everybody's got some error. Some are more pronounced than others. Uh, the ones with the uh, plenum chamber uh, behind the uh, port are l will sh probably show less error than one that's just got the pitot tube sticking out into the airstream. Agreed. And I kind of responded to that question, and I did say that it's uh, if you if you were to compare an ASK twenty one to a SGS two thirty three. You know, the 233 doesn't have as much of an error, uh, depending on the severity of the slip. But the 233 um, versus the, the K21, the K21, you can't trust the airspeed at all because of that recessed uh, pitot tube. Yeah. Versus 233, that it's just straight out in the air that is not recessed. And then when you get over to like a DG300, where you've got a plenum chamber behind that port, then the plenum chamber itself is uh, has a has a tendency to be uh, uh, to mitigate the error. Exactly. Okay. Next one. Next one. Are there any general rules for how to recover if one exceeds the red line? Gently. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, the okay. When you're red line. Okay. Anything above the uh, on on every aircraft that I've flown, uh, so power and uh, and non-powered. Uh, anytime you're above the green arc, you've got limitations on uh, how much control you can use. And so one of the things is that you you know if you are diving and you're up around red line and you suck the stick back against your tummy, 
Uh, you've just put a tremendous amount of energy into your airframe, and it's likely something is going to bend or break. Um, somebody did that with a 136 years ago in the wave uh, in Colorado and actually bent the spar in a 136. They dove down to notch their barograph and pulled back real hard and uh, bent the spar in the aircraft. Now they got the aircraft back to home, but, uh, you know, you know what they say, you know, an excellent landing is one where the aircraft is usable. And this one wasn't usable after that. So the key is, is that when you're getting into the, any of those corner conditions, uh, you, you, you cannot delay your recovery. In other words, you have to take action, but you have to take action gently because the result of taking a gross or our harsh action could be worse. I mean, the first thing is, the first thing is, is you get your wings level and uh, be sure you're stable and then start correcting from there. But again, you've got to do it gently. Next question. Very well said, Dave. Let's go to the next one. So what are the physics behind the decrease of red line as altitude increases? Um, in gen what, what it is, is it's the decrease in uh, the air density. And the, the number one thing that you're trying to prevent is you're trying to prevent flutter in the structure of the aircraft. Flutter is where the aircraft, the structure is extracting energy from the airflow and then it's responding to it. So for instance, um, the, uh, you can, you can, the, remember I said that the, the uh, certification rule said you can't have control reversal. Okay, control reversal is where you deflect your, for instance, you deflect your aileron and instead, uh, you know, if you put the aileron up and instead of the uh, wing, instead of that wing going down, the wing actually goes up because what's happened is you're going to twist the wing. The wing doesn't have sufficient torsional stiffness. You're going to twist the wing with that controlled deflection, and it's actually going to reverse. It's going to respond in the opposite direction. Uh, B-47s had that problem uh, when they were at high altitude and at high speed. What happens is with the less dense air, you don't have the aerodynamic, you don't have the air density dampening the structure. Uh, LAC-12s carry 20 pounds of lead in the leading edge at the outer wing tip along the leading edge. There's a 20 pound bar out there and its purpose is to change the uh, torsional frequency to raise the frequency so that if it got into a flutter out there that it would stabilize. Um, other aircraft have uh, different things that they put out there. One of the things with flutter, by the way, and I meant to mention this back when we were looking at the flutter videos, when the, if you get flutter and you're trying to, you slow the aircraft down. Okay. So let's say you got the flutter at 110 knots, whether it's wing, tail, whatever, you, you've got the divergence going on with the aircraft and you slow the aircraft down gently. Okay, what it turns out is that the actual flutter speed is the speed at which the flutter stops. So like with my Concept 70, when I had the flutter in the uh, rudder, uh, again, I was running, you know, 100 or 110 knots or something like that. The flutter did not stop until I got down to 65 knots. So technically what that meant is I could at high altitude and get a disturbance that energizes it or starts the flutter. I could have gotten that flutter conceptually at 65 knots. So when you're looking at these things, um, the real key, the physics behind it is with the reduced air density, the structure has less dampening on the structure. And so it's more likely to go into a uh, uncontrolled uh, movement. 
Very good. Thank you, Dave. A uh, few more questions here. And actually, they're rolling in a lot, but I'm going to try to consolidate these a little bit. I think this is a good one. Um, in the stall speed versus altitude question, what speed are we referenced to? I'm assuming true speed change, true airspeed change, not the indicated airspeed change. Um, there's something in there I'm missing. Stall speed versus altitude. What speed is it being referred to? Is that the true airspeed change? No, But okay. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Um, okay, stall is not airspeed. Stall is load and angle of attack. Okay, so uh, the key, the key here, for instance, uh, you know, the the stall, uh, you will stall at a higher speed, but at a higher load. So it's load and angle of attack. Um, so the uh, So theoretically, at higher speeds, you can get to a hang higher angle of attack before you get to separation. You can get to higher loads. So that's what, you know. So the, the key with this is uh, the, the stall is a function of load. Uh, so wing lo uh, you're loading on the wing and, uh, and uh, angle of attack. And, and the angle of attack is the dominant, uh, is the dominant term in the, in the overall equation. So like if you're banked up at 45 degrees, you've got less wing. So the load is up higher. And so as you come up on the angle of attack, you, you get to the angle of attack uh, sooner. You know, if you're coming down in air, you know, as you're coming down in airspeed. So it it's still all, you know, it's still true airspeed is used for computations. True airspeed is not used as safety information in front of you. What you've got in front of you for safety information is the indicated airspeed. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. I got two more questions for you. You ready? Mm -hmm. What referenced airspeeds are subject to true versus indicated airspeed? Um, what I know we talked about uh, never exceed yeah as a true airspeed reference. Yeah, true. Uh, okay, the the basis for the correction is uh, the uh, the air the it's true air it's the you, hmm. Sorry, I'm working through the computation in my head, and I just confused myself. Yeah, um, you, you, the change in the VNE is based on uh, air density change, but the fundamental term, the starting term, is the true airspeed at the certification altitude. All of the others are not on true airspeed. If there are changes, for instance, uh, the uh, aerobatic or the loading, uh, not aerobatic, the loading changes, like when you can use full control deflection and you have to use reduced control of deflection, those are all based on uh, loading, not on, or, yeah, on loading. So, and those come back to the gross weight of the aircraft. So if you're gro if you're to max gross weight of the aircraft, you have a higher speed that you can operate at for a given deflection than if you're operating at a lower gross weight on the aircraft, uh, you know, and we can vary the weight of our aircraft, you know, like 400 pounds. And so if I've got a, uh, an 1100 pound gl uh, max gross glider and I can vary the weight with ballast by 400 pounds, uh, at that point, I can run into, uh, uh, I can run into conditions that I can't use uh, full control deflection at a lower airspeed. Now, the certification requirements are trying to get that to where uh, if you stay within their guidelines, like if you're in the yellow arc and, and whatever, or you're below the rough airspeed and things like that, that for the most part, you're not likely to get into trouble, even if you're not at max gross weight. Okay. I know that's not a very satisfying answer because there's a whole <laughs> lot of, of wiggle room in there of that basically says, be careful if you're playing games. Fair enough. Last question. 
Total energy barriers are sensitive to strong gustiness in thermals. Are they or aren't they? Total energy barriers are, are uh, total energy. The single tip cranked probe is prone to uh, gusts, side gusts, because of the design of the probe. The more modern probes that you see that kind of have a little V shape. In other words, they've got two legs on them and uh, they, you know, you put them in horizontally and then they've got the sensors on the back side on each of the legs are far less sensitive to gusts, to horizontal gusts. And so are less sensitive to the gusts in the thermal. Uh, that's why, uh, that's why they ended up moving to them. Uh, I read some papers a while back and I don't, I, I lost them when I changed my computer, you know, when I upgraded my computer the last time and I haven't found them, but the putting the, the dual headed kind of a Y shape, uh, uh, total energy probe makes them, they're still sensitive in some degree, but it makes them much, much less sensitive than the single cranked arm type TE probe. Okay. And that, and I changed, uh, let's see, I changed my Ventus, uh, one year I was out at Nephi and Craggy was there and he had one that fit my plane. And so I flew one day with my original single sensor probe. And then I flew the next day with the two sensor probe and I did not ask him for my money back. I kept it. <laughs> It, it, it really did. It made that much of a difference because, and it also uh, stabilized for the horizontal gusts that it, it helped stabilize for the horizontal gusts you get when you're, when you run into a turbulence boundary, like you're running into the boundary of a thermal or you're running into a, a air mass change. It uh, got rid of some of the gust uh, uncertainty with those. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. Uh... The last thing I'll just tell you, it's not a question, it's just a statement. I've had, I don't know how many dozens of people say that this was exceptional, so thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for participating this evening. Um, so next time, uh, same bat channel, same bat time, and if you're old enough, that will give you a little bit of a smile. Uh, February 9th, and we'll be talking about an introduction to portable gliding glide computers. Um, and it seems like the questions have tapered off. Yep, well, Dave, uh, I'll, the rest of them I'll handle on my side. Thank you. All righty. So do you, do you need us to stay online for a little bit so you can answer, or are you going to answer them in emails? Yeah, if you could just stay online for about uh, seven or eight minutes, I'll handle these. Okay. Frank, if you'll leave him online for a little bit and uh... – Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you attending. I'll do that. And uh, thank you very much, Dave. Another great presentation. Thank you.